would hope not. Okay, we are we are live. So uh, this is government operations, uh, Senate government operations, Friday, May twenty second, and we're looking at a couple different things. We're going to have some general discussion, but we are also looking at um, for right now. We're going to take up H seven ninety three, which relates to the um, powers and duties of the auditor. So um, auditor of accounts to be specific. Um, so Betsy, do you want to um, walk us through the bill and then we'll hear from Andrew? Is that okay? Okay, thank you. Hello. And it is, we do have it here. Great. And I did email to you a section by section summary of the bill also. You did? Okay. Is it up? Is it on? The, should we go to your, our emails or to our the website? Let's see. It's in the email. Would, should we look at? Should we look at the summary or look at the bill? I would prefer if the if it also went to the. So it's posted so that if, it's hard to move between that and the, email for me, but it's easier for me to move between documents uh, as posted. Uh, Senator. I'm working on it. I okay. have to go to a remote desktop, so it takes a little bit longer. Okay, yeah, thank you. Shortly. I only yep. sent it to Gail right before the meeting, so she didn't yep. have time to get this posted. Yep, but, but thank you. Um, as, as passed by the House is up on our website. Correct. Yes. yes. So for the record, Betsy Ann Rask, Legislative Council, this bill as passed House H-793 relates to the powers and duties of the auditors of accounts. And you'll find that, um, Many of these amendments are clarifying in nature or just reorganizing statute, um, but also eliminates some of the duties that the auditor has in regard to entities outside of his office. So the first thing that would be amended in section one is the main statute that describes the duties of our auditor of accounts. And the first thing that's going on here in subdivision one you'll see it's adding a new subdivision 1B that says that the auditor of accounts has the duty to annually perform or contract for the financial and compliance audits of the state of Vermont's federal programs as required by federal law, except that the audit requirement doesn't apply to UVM or Vermont State Colleges. But what is going on here is really just moving language to 1B that currently exists in Subdivision nine of this statute. So if you are happen, if you happen to be looking at the bill itself, if you scroll down to page four, you'll see subdivision nine is being repealed. And that's the same language that's talking about the duty of the auditor to either perform or contract with an independent public accountant to perform uh, financial and compliance audits as required by federal law and specifically saying this doesn't apply to UVM or Vermont State Colleges. So this is an example of an organizational change just so it would place the auditor's main annual audit duties all in this first subdivision one. So it's uh, laid out at the top what the auditor's main duties are. And also just note that there's a clarification here um, in the subdivision nine in the current law, it refers to the Federal Single Audit Act um, you'll see when this language gets moved from current subdivision nine up to this 1B, it refers more generally to this requirement to audit as required by federal law without citing the Federal Single Audit Act. And that's because um, in speaking with Andrew, hello, Andrew, Andrew um, uh, the federal single, the reference to the Federal single, single Audit Act is not entirely accurate because now uh, federal law requires these audits of federal programs by the states pursuant to a uniform guidance that's set forth in the code of federal regulations. So it seemed to just be a better uh, site to say as required by federal law rather than a federal uh, act. That's really not the accurate description at this point. So mainly for organizational purposes, that uh, amendment to subdivision one. Moving so that's, on. all in, that's all in 1A and B? Yes, the, the move from- There's a lot of words for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, just want to make it clear what's going on here. Okay, I thought you were really going a clarification and organization for that subdivision one. 
Um, subdivision three, I'm still in section one. And if you're looking at the bill itself, we're now on page two, but okay. subdivision three revises how the auditor of account audit reports, recommendations and corrective actions are posted on the auditor of, account, auditor of accounts website and when the auditor of account has to follow up on recommendations that the auditor of accounts made. So right now, if you look at the current law, it's saying that the auditor has to uh, post things, uh, the audit reports on his or her website by July 1st, and it describes what these reports um, have to contain and um, when the, uh, the auditor, current law says the auditor has to follow up on these uh, the recommendations that he made and the auditor's um, reports at least biennially. And this new language would say follow up um, for up to three years rather than um, follow up at least biennially. And this is just pursuant to, as I understand it, some feedback from the auditor of accounts about how the auditor conducts these audits. And um, I, I believe the auditor of accounts would just like some more flexibility on how these audit reports are actually ha have to be uh, posted, what makes sense from the auditor of accounts perspective um, and more auditor of accounts control over what an audit actually contains. I can clarify a little bit if you'd like, would that be helpful, Betsy Ann? Fine by me if it's uh, okay with the chair. I think, kind of chair. I think we should walk through the whole bill first and Perfect. then you can so that we have a sense of what it is because we've never we've never seen the bill before. Perfect. And, Sounds great. And Andrew, I I should apologize to you. I'm when we meet in the state house in person, I'm so used to if there's a person who hasn't been in there before, we always introduce ourselves and sure. I just have been neglecting to do that here. So because you haven't been with us before, I'm Jeanette White from Wyndham County. And I would ask the committee to introduce themselves. Okay. Sorry. I, I'm Anthony from Washington County. Brian Collimore, Rutland County. Allison Clarkson, Windsor County. It's good to see you, Andrew. Good to see you too, Allison. And Chris Bray from the Addison Senate District. Madam Chair, sorry I joined late. I, I got knocked out of the floor session uh, Zoom sort of crashed and burned. I had to reinstall, restart my computer. So I'm a little tardy getting back here. Oh, it's okay, yeah. but you, your tie is perfectly tied, so it's fine. And you have a new background. <laughs> okay, thank you. And I, I do apologize for not introducing ourselves right at the beginning, but okay, Betsy Ann. Okay, I'm at the bottom of page two of the bill. Uh, in regard, actually travel on to the top of page three. In regard to this subdivision four, um, this would be eliminating the requirement that auditor of account audit reports be furnished to and kept in the state library. Um, I don't, if I'm recalling correctly, the auditor of accounts didn't propose this. It was a correction that House GovOps was pursuing anyhow. I think it's in regard to what has to be posted or given to the state library, especially now that our state library is not in full force. And also um, the auditor of accounts audit reports are on the auditor's website. So they are still available for public, public use. Um, if you're looking at page four of the bill, you can see that deletion of subdivision nine, but we already discussed that. That's just moving those provisions up to subdivision one. And then if you look at page five of the bill, there's an amendment to subdivision 12. Um, this is in regard to the current law uh, duty of the auditor to make available to county, municipal, and school district officials with fiduciary responsibilities and education program. Uh, right now, this is a requirement for the auditor of accounts to uh, provide this education program, and it specifies what that program has to entail and who the auditor has to consult with to create it. This proposal is to provide, let's say, that the auditor of accounts would provide these local fiduciary officials with an education program related to their responsibilities as resources permit. Um, so it's not um, a requirement no matter what, um, but it's as the auditor of accounts resources permit to provide that education. And it's more general language to say it's just in regard to their fiduciary responsibilities without specifying what it has to entail. 
then we're moving on to section two. All that is doing is correcting the cross reference with section one's move of subdivision nine up to subdivision one. So that's just a technical correction. Section three, I would also classify as a technical correction on page six of the bill. Um, current law has specific language requiring the auditor of accounts to audit uh, the accounts of the board and liquor and lottery. Um, but this language was deemed by the auditor of accounts as unnecessary since the auditor already has the duty at the top of section 6.1 to uh, annually perform or contract for the performance of an audit of the basic financial statements of the state. So it was unnecessary to repeat that specifically for the Board of Liquor and Lottery since the auditor already has the general um, duty to do this for the state's financial statements generally. Uh, section four and five are similar. If you are on page, where are we on page four or section four, starts at the bottom of page six. Um, this is an elimination of the requirement for the auditor of accounts to serve as the state's non-voting representative to an audit committee of the Vermont State Colleges. And similarly, um, in section five, eliminating the requirement for the auditor of accounts to serve as the state's non-voting representative to an audit committee established uh, by VSAC. Then six, section six um, on page nine eliminates the requirement for the auditor of accounts to prescribe the form of county budgets. And that's it. Finally, section seven is the effective date of July 1. All right. Are there any uh, technical corrections for Betsy about the way the bill is written? No. All right. If not, then, um, oh, I'm sorry, Anthony. No, I said no. Did you have a, oh, oh, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so. I was responding. <laughs> I know you were, I know. Okay, so Andrew, would you like to then give us the rationale for why these changes? Sure. And I would ask also if there was um, any opposition to any of the sections, and if so, where that came from? Sure. Yeah, so Andrew Stein, Deputy State Auditor. Um, I'm in Washington County right now. And uh, there, there, we have not received any opposition to anything in here whatsoever. And this bill was drafted in a way, anything that might be controversial, we had some a proposal related to our appropriations and that was actually introduced by the governor um, in his big bill and that's not in here. There was another proposal from our office um, related to TIF. That's not in here. This was intentionally meant to modernize and clean up the state auditor's office's statutes um, in, in a way that has really been, it's really needed this cleanup now for about four or five years. And every year we conduct a quality assurance review for our office. And that's to ensure that we're following our laws and our policies. And when we're peer reviewed on a three year basis, they review that work too, and they review our laws and policies. And this, this represents corrections and cleanups that will help us come into compliance with those laws and policies primarily. And anywhere where we can streamline things as well, we've tried to do that. So I'll just, Go, if anybody has any questions along the way or any questions at the beginning, please let me know. It's, it's pretty routine stuff, but it doesn't mean that, you know, you might not have important questions and considerations for this. So um, I'll, go, I'll go through this and try to keep it as brief as possible. So shifting, as Betsy, as Betsy Ann mentioned, shifting the financial and compliance audit statement up under B and saying federal law rather than the Single Audit Act, that recognizes that the Single Audit Act has, has been replaced by newer legislation. And also on a nearly annual basis, the Office of Management and Budget at the federal level issues a compliance supplement, which is an additional set of rules that we need to follow. So just by saying by federal law, it, it encompasses everything there um, in our statute. Uh, also, the, the, fed, the 
the requirement is actually to have a financial and compliance audit of federal programs. So we included uh, that financial language as well. I'm just going down through here. We post every all all reports, uh, any public public documents um, that that we produce, any reports related to the sheriff's performance audits, annual financial audits, compliance audits. They all go on our website, and we keep them there in perpetuity, at least under this auditor and under the former auditor. We and and prior auditors, really, we have a lot of that information. And then we follow the public records law and uh, any public documents are archived. So after we talked with government mm -hmm. operations on the House side about some of this stuff and the language here and the language that's already in law, we all felt like accomplished um, some of the changes that they were hoping to make this year related to that. Um, let me just move along here. So the language that shifts how we follow up on the auditor's recommendations, that changed years ago. So in law, it says follow up every two to four years. And we began following up every one to three years. And the thinking there is if after a year you follow back up, you're, you're more likely to have um, success in working with an auditee if you follow up a year later rather than two years later if there are some issues that need to be addressed if there are conversations that need to be had following up a year later rather than two years later was found to be a more effective timeline for this so we're still following up as much as we would under a two to four year cycle we're just shifting that cycle up by a year and so that has been the practice of the auditor's office and every year for the past five or six years now uh, in the quality assurance review, we've had to note that we're out of compliance with that law and why we're out of compliance with it. <laughs> so Andrew, this is sort of a no brainer kind of question, but yep. you would normally, not you, but normally you do make it, do an audit, make some recommendations, then you wait, you wait two years before you follow it up to see if the recommendations are being followed. So now we follow up one year later. Right, I'm saying, but it had been two years. That seems that doesn't seem like a long time to follow up to see if somebody's been following your recommendations. That yeah, that's that that was the general thinking. We've seen an increase. The office has seen an increase in uh, adherence to audit recommendations since that practice went into place. Sure. So. So let's see here. I'm just scrolling through. So the annual audit requirement for liquor and lottery, as Betsy Ann mentioned, the financial audit, which we have the CAFR, right? The comparative annual financial reports for the state, which those are the state's audited financial statements. And our office is responsible for the audit component of that. And now that liquor and lottery are together, it's kind of interesting, but liquor is part of our offices and we contract out this work, our offices, annual financial audit. Lottery has its own annual financial audit and that is accounted for um, in the CAFR. So this work is being done on an annual basis. So we don't do this because it would be redundant um, to the work that's already happening. And so that's another example of something that we note every year. We're not following this law, but here's the reason why we're not following this law. It's already essentially being accomplished by you know this other section of law. The let's see here the 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 recommendation, the proposal to remove ourselves as non-voting members from the audit committees of VSAC and state colleges. That doesn't mean that we can't audit the state colleges in VSAC. And actually those are component units of the state of Vermont and they are part of the annual financial audit. What happened was you're, under Tom Salmon, it's my understanding under Tom Salmon, our chief auditor and director of performance audits flagged an independence issue. And that was if we're voting members on the internal audit committees of these organizations, it was also UVM at the time as well, that presented independence issues because we're we're an arm's length independent office going in and either contracting or using our FTEs to conduct these 
audits and oftentimes the internal audit committees are helping on that organization side coordinate the audit. So we couldn't really be assisting with the audit that we're conducting for that organization. So that change was made. And then once that change was made, we didn't really have much of a role on those committees. Auditor Hopper wanted to maintain the non-voting role for UVM simply because it's such a large budget. And if they ever did want, want our advice or want to work with our office um, to improve audit processes, he thought we should still extend that, um, extend ourselves in that direction. So that's the one exception to this. And I did talk with him yesterday and I brought up that exception because I thought you might ask about it. And he said, if you really felt otherwise, he would be fine removing us from that, uh, from that audit committee as well. But he just thought because of the amount of money there and because they're a more complex organization that there might be a need at some point in time. The, the truth of the matter is the state auditor's office can provide what are called non-audit services to, um, to state organizations to assist with projects and programs. We actually, at the beginning of COVID-19, uh, reached out to the Department of Labor. This was literally the first week that everything was shutting down to offer our services, non-audit services. They didn't take us up on that, but that's an example of how we can extend ourselves to um, entities that we would normally audit to assist. So let me see if there's anything else here that I'm missing. I think that I think that just about covers it. Do any of you have any questions for me? Any committee members have any questions? I mean, this seems pretty straightforward and in many cases getting codifying that what's actually happening here and catching the catching up the statutes to the reality. <laughs> Anthony, did you have a question or yeah, yeah, it's just kind of a dumb one. I should know the answer to this, but we talk about you talk about you know whether or not to audit the board of liquor and lottery, et cetera. When you do the what's called the general audit, I guess when somebody does that, are you audit, auditing like all the different state agencies? I mean, so they what they do, uh, they take a sample uh, of expenditures and revenues. So it is possible that in some years, some entities there. They look across funds. They don't look by department and agency so much. They, they, they take a sample of expenditures and revenues. And so the, the, the annual financial statements are prepared across the state of Vermont. And then the auditors take, take a sample and they go down through a checklist, really scrutinizing certain expenditures um, and, and certain revenues. That's what the financial audit really is in ensuring that from that sample you know, there's there's compliance with the state's financial laws, that there aren't any major accounting errors. And there have been some accounting errors in the past that these audits have flagged. Um, and it can just be simple stuff like, you know, a couple of zeros in the, in the wrong place for the beginning net position of a department or agency's internal service fund or something, you know, very nitty gritty like that. Um, and then, the, and, and so that's the financial audit for the state. And then there's these annual, what, what's called the federal single audit, where the, the auditors go into federal programs that are above a certain threshold. So everything from um, SNAP benefit programs to education programs, Medicaid is an annual program because it's, there's so much money there. It's a high risk program. It's classified as a high risk program because of the amount of money. Um, and so that's audited on an annual basis just to ensure that those, those really high value federal programs and the state's expenditure of those federal awards is done in compliance, not only with federal law, but also with state law. So and ensuring that the laws that you all have worked so hard to create are also followed in the, ex in the expense of those funds. But that, that big general audit, that's done by someone you contract with, right? That's right. Yeah, Clifton right. Larson Allen is who we contract with now. Previously, it was KPMG. KPMG, right, sure. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're and, welcome. And, uh, Allison? Uh, Andrew, could, if I could just follow up on Anthony's question. So do, do agencies and departments know when to expect and what line items you're going to expect? Or is it sort of a, a spot 
certain inspection and in, in, in you know a spot audit that that they will surprise people so they aren't necessarily fully prepared for them so it definitely depends on the agency and department so before i worked for the tax department as the research economist there on the policy outreach and legislative affairs team but one of the internal services that i provided was to our revenue accounting and processing team and when we were shifting to this new IT system for all of our taxes, which was a successful transition, which is why most people haven't heard about it, um, <laughs> the the um, you know the the annual um, accounting process of shifting those cash based uh, revenue numbers to accrual, which the CAFRs accrual based accounting, which is what what are our accounts receivable, not what cash was actually received in that fiscal year. Um, that whole process was very, very involved. And I assisted with that in designing those reports. And it's because the tax department knew every single year, the auditors were going to be in there scrutinizing revenue numbers. And finance and management knows every single year, you know, those folks who work on this, they're going to be dealing with these issues. Diva, for example, their accounting people, AHS, for example, they know every single year they're going to be dealing with these folks. But some of the smaller guys, some of the some of the smaller departments and agencies, with regard to the financial audit, even in the legislature this this past year, there there were um, because it's it, it's for all of state government. There were some questions that were directed to. Um, the sergeant at arms, and I don't think she had encountered those types of questions before. So she was pretty surprised, for example. Um, so there are some there there are some business units uh, as as they're classified in our accounting system, which are different departments, agencies, divisions that won't receive these auditing services as regularly as other departments and agencies. Bye. But the the yeah. federal the ones the federal audit that is more routine that yeah, is no, more annual. Yeah, it's it's annual for high dollar programs yeah. or for those programs that have shown material weaknesses. But otherwise, it's generally on like a three year cycle. Sort of like the the fee bill used mm -hmm. to be. <laughs> yeah, Brian. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, Andrew, the last section: all county budgets shall. And it used to say to be presented on the form prescribed uh, after consultation with the aside judges. Why? Why is that going away again? I know. I think Betsy tried to explain. Or she so, probably did explain yeah. it, but I didn't get her. Oh, sure, sure. So you know, er, the the state auditor's office hasn't actually provided this service in a, in a long time, and we are in regular contact, or at least I'm in pretty regular contact with a number of the county administrators and with the, sh the sheriffs. Um, and I think this is kind of some antiquated language from a long time ago when budgets were submitted on paper. Okay. And, and now, um, you know, the, the counties really handle their own budgets. Um, and, you know, we haven't for, for years, nobody in our office can remember a time when we've provided uh, the counties with a form that they had to use for their budgeting uh, Excellent answer. purposes. Thank you. Yeah. Any more questions for Andrew? So, it, yes, it Allison? Just, I just have to make a comment. It just seems like a long time, Andrew, since I saw you taking that exam in the basement of tax. It just seems like ages ago, doesn't it? <laughs> With years and years ago. Um, so are we, it, since there was no opposition to this bill at all from any place and anything that might have generated opposition has been, is not in here. Um, are we, we have permission, Anthony, am I right to vote on this bill? Correct. So. Although they're, are, they're, they're, they're still, you know, they're, they're in awe of how many bills we actually move out of this committee. So. I know. They would like us to slow down, but that's okay. No, I'm not going to slow down. <laughs> right. They they can we can put it on the calendar. They can take it up when they want to, but it'll be ready. And they need to catch up. Right. I know those, some of those committees are very slow. I tell them it's because of the chair and the staff. We just can't keep moving forward. <laughs> So, Brian. Brian. I will make the motion then, Madam Chair. 
that we vote out H793 as passed by the other body with no amendments. All right. Is right. the clerk ready to call the roll? She is, although her package was just sealed for Gail Carrigan with all the other vote sheets, and now we're gonna have to reopen it. Uh, Senator I bet Gray. you can figure that one out. <laughs> yes. Senator Clarkson. Yes. Senator Collimore. Yes. Senator Polina. Yes. Senator White. Yes. Right. Would anybody like to report this bill? Brian? Sure. All right. Thank you very much. And I also just want to thank all of you for your diligence and resiliency in the face of really unprecedented times. And also thank you to Betsy Ann for your hard work on this. You did a great job as always. So she, appreciate all of your efforts. Work. We're lucky. I told you it's about the staff and the chair. And apparently the House Committee did a good job on it too because we don't have any amendments. Yeah, yeah. We, don't, we don't have to cite that though. Every, every once in a while we need to, we need to, you know. Yeah. <laughs> all right, so we're done with that one. Thank you, Andrew. Thank Thanks, you all, Andrew. I'll, I'll leave now, thank you. Have you a can, you're weekend. welcome to stay. <laughs> thank you. We always I, love to have people. I can watch on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I hope you have other things to do. Take care. <laughs> yeah, me too. So um, we are not scheduled until 145, but if Damien and uh, the Adjutant General are with us, we might move there, but I don't see them. They are not here. We have a few minutes here, um, <clears throat> and I... So I'm going to apologize for not getting out the um, the um, law enforcement, the um, sh what came from the sheriffs. I haven't ha even had a chance to um, look at what they've sent me um, about their their uh, lost revenues. So I oh, apologize right. for not getting that out yet. Um, Brian, do you? Did you have any uh, conversations about the um, um, chair, executive director of the academy? I did, Madam Chair. Um, and I did make a point that it had nothing to do with the current emergency, although I think tangentially, tangentially it does. Um, the governor promised that that would be taken up as quickly as possible. Let me just refer to my notes. Yeah, I asked him if there could be an interim director appointed ASAP and that the training council be allowed to go ahead with the search or some, some group go ahead with uh, a search. And I was assured by both the governor and by Secretary Young um, that that would be forthcoming in the next few days, um, that they had it on their radar. They were well aware of it. And perhaps Michael Sherling, actually, if he is going to join us later today, mm -hmm. might be able to comment on it as well. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. Um, would it be helpful for us to send a follow-up letter to them um, just saying that the committee um, supports the um, sentiments that were offered by Senator Collimore? Yes, I think that'd be great. Okay. I will do that this afternoon. Ah, oh, you don't have to waste the rest of the day doing that, Madam Chair. It's you've too nice too a day. Many, yeah, you've got too many I know, but to I, if I, it'll take me less than five minutes, and I can do it, and then it's done. Okay. And then I don't have to wake up in the night and say, "Oh my God, did you do that or didn't you do that?" You well, do that too, that. huh? There's that. Yeah, I do that. Yeah, I think I think this is a, a period in our lives where lots of us are doing it, which is I don't usually do it, but may I so, ask a, may I ask a question, Madam Chair? Yes. So I was 
look on the floor today as I was cruising through to get to the bills we were discussing. Uh, I I was reminded that there are a lot a couple of our bills still uh, and amendments and things that are still on the calendar of second reading. Okay. Um, hold, hold. Can you hold on one second? Sure. Certainly. Did anybody else notice the uh, F-35s when they went by? No. Yeah, pretty impressive. Yeah. They roared through Waterbury, above Waterbury. And they roared through Rutland. And what are they doing? They're saluting the essential workers at all the hospitals in the state. Oh, really? Yeah. And is that supposed to be something people like, all that noise? That's supposed to be a thank you? <laughs> I had a feeling that might be lost on you, Senator Clarkson, but <laughs> yes. <laughs> I thought it was great, absolutely great, top notch. As I they have, said. I have How so many were there? How many were there? Like four. Four. Yeah. Did they do some fancy things? No, a flyby means they just fly by. Okay, and okay. it wasn't like and, an air show. And, and and I hope the essential workers were actually able to uh, appreciate, you know, take time to enjoy that. They were well informed ahead of time in the oh, regional were? medical center. Um, I don't think they came down here. Oh yeah, they did almost every hospital in the state. Oh, yeah. did they? We actually, oh. we, had an e we all got an email with it with a map. Of yeah, where we they did. Were going. Yeah. yeah, we did. Oh yes, we did. Oh, yeah. I heard a lot of noise. Yeah, that would be that them. Was it. That, oh, okay. Anyway, I was just sort of wasting time while you did what you needed to do, Madam Chair. Okay, so I'll say hear. one more one more thing here. Did you find them? Okay, um, I, I was some asking, lost lost car keys. Um, oh. I was asking you a question. Oh, when you went to deal with the lost car keys. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. No, no. My question is about the the things we have amendments to, and we have an amendment. We had a strike all amendment actually to the restructuring of the Agency of Human Services. That is not. You have not talked about that with rules. I, my understanding is that is a low priority. I mean, not to you, but to me. <laughs> and so I, I just need to know it when I just, for those of us who have amendments who are, because we do have a few amendments, I think, other than mine for Agency of Human Services, just I need a heads up as to when we're gonna be doing it. What I would, what I would say is, first of all, that particular bill I think is not, um, we're not going to work. Push I, it. I, I don't think so, because I don't think the House will, even has any interest in doing it. But what I would say is that we, if there's anything on the calendar that we have, and Brian, you for 233 and me for 220, that we should be prepared at any moment to, to do it. Just like the other day when Tim asked me on Wednesday night if I would, or Tuesday night, if I would do S99, we need to be prepared to to do them if he calls them up. Okay, and so it, Betsy Ann, are you still there? Yes, if you put your um, thing on all, seeing everybody, then you would be able to see us and you would be able to see when Brian raises his hand. I know, but I'm focusing on who's speaking. I'm trying to focus on who's speaking. I know, but that isn't helpful. If you were in the committee and you had on blinders, it wouldn't be helpful. Sometimes it would be. <laughs> no, only if we had on blinders. <laughs> <laughs> um, Betsy Ann, to that end, um, I would love to have a conversation with you about 297. So I am prepped. So I will will be in touch later. I, I believe that was Jennifer Carby's bill. As oh, as it was, that's right, okay. <laughs> Okay, so I will, um, I see we're, we've been joined by the Adjutant General, but, and just before we jump there, um, I would, um, I had a conversation this morning or between the floor and now with um, the elections officials. Yes. And um, we are going to on schedule on Tuesday elections issue the issue of the elections and the potential bill that we have which would not be um 
<laughs> the bill that Betsy Ann originally gave to us because that actually put us in control of determining what would happen, but instead just removing with agreement. So from the original bill so that it would still be there with consultation, but not with agreement. And I believe that the governor has actually given us, invited us to do that in his press conferences. Chris? Um, so I think our second draft still is, uh, it's not quite as simple as withdrawing the with agreement. So I was, when the time is right, It'd be good to look at it as a committee again. Okay, I did. I didn't see a second draft, but or I haven't seen it yet. I, but. Didn't, send, I didn't send the committee a second draft yet. But we talked about it. Yes. Okay. Right. Well, then I'm sorry. I think I saw. I thought I saw a, a follow up. Anyway, when we get there, um, I, I just want us to, I was trying to have us be ahead of the game so that. We'd have a, a draft to look at again, and in case well, there was yet another change. But I, I think we all agreed where we were going. It's really it was as simple and narrow as possible, getting rid of the a phrase, right? Yes, and I would ask Betsy if you would have that done with just removing with agreement. So, in consultation, you want to maintain. You want to maintain the consultation. Yeah, I mean, there's already been a lot of consultation, so we don't want to necessarily remove that and think that the governor isn't involved at all, but just remove the with agreement. And I, I'm not going to uh, try to read anybody's mind, but it seems to me that in the press conferences that the governor has actually invited us to do so, to do that. So, um, and then we can post that so that on Tuesday, we can have any discussion and anybody who supports that or opposes that um, change could come in and testify because I, I we want to make sure that we hear from everybody about that change. Chris? Um, the other thing too was that phrase that we started to try to use to get it out there that it's the distribution of ballots by mail. Yes. I don't know if that might go into a heading or reader aids or if it even gets into the language but uh, if there's an opportunity to use that, uh, I think it's almost, it's clarifying and de-escalatory. De okay. I, I'm yeah, not sure I how think, we would do that. Because I think, the, I think, well, that's not a bad idea. That would be us prescribing in the bill more what we wanted to see happen. And I think, yeah. that it, like what you're talking about, Chris, is what the, is what the Secretary of State should announce, that this is the, the path they're going down. You know, right. the ability to vote by mail if you want to do it, yeah, as yeah. opposed Thank to us you. putting it in the bill. Yep, you're right. Thanks. I have to admit that I corrected the Secretary of State about three or four times today in the meeting because he used vote by mail. And I said, never use that phrase again. And, and they also talked about using voter choice, but it isn't that either because voters currently have a choice of how to how to vote. This is just ballot delivery by mail. Right. And that's, that is what it is. So um, anyway, we will do that. And um, we will hear from whoever wants to testify, town clerks, um, advocacy groups, um, political parties, anybody who wants to testify on Tuesday. Brian. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Even though I probably won't support the new legislation, in the spirit of trying to still be a good committee member and participate, I don't want to wait until Tuesday to bring this up, but someone asked me whether, since we had already passed the bill regarding this topic earlier this session, is it possible to open up the same topic and introduce us another bill? And I admitted I didn't know the answer to that. So I thought I'd bring it up today in case it becomes an issue rather than bring it up Tuesday and then have everybody say, well, why didn't you mention that Friday? No, good, good. That's, that's very good. So we should, we should run that by um, Secretary Bloomer. Chris? Well, 
I think Brian's saying the same thing. You know, it's like, are we negating an action of the legislature by removing that phrase? Right. Yeah, it's a question of substantial negation. We get the secretary is definitely the ultimate authority, but I don't think it is substantial negation because it's not the opposite of what you already enacted, which is what I understand substantial negation to be. I didn't know there was a term. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Lawyers okay. have a term for everything. Uh, <laughs> and and uh, Jeanette, while we're talking about agenda, one thing I would really like to uh, discuss is what we can do as a committee to further boost the awareness that the, that we that people have to be responding to the census. Uh, I think okay. we're, we're I, I, I think we that. want to do that, but we have the attorney, the adjutant general, on with us right now, and it is time to go to move to that. I don't want to hold him up while we have committee discussion. So we will return to that conversation. Right, and 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 may I make okay. a request before the adjutant general um, uh, talks uh, that we have Brian thank the adjutant general on behalf of all of us for, for what happened today. Well, maybe Brian would want to do that anyway, even without asking him. Yeah, we're uh, <laughs> we're talking about the flyover today, which. I greeted with uh, much enthusiasm, and I appreciate the efforts of the uh, the guard. It was it was really well done. Are you there with us, well, Greg? Perhaps that fell on deaf ears. No, nope, there he is. There he is. How's everybody doing? Good. Good. Did you just hear Brian? I, I did, and sir, thank you. Um, that was absolutely an honor for us to be able to do that. And I have to give credit where, where credit is due. Um, so Colonel Shevchik and, and his team over at the 158th Fighter Wing really facilitated this happening. We were on the backside of the authorization window for that. So um, he pulled some strings back channel and I was kind of uh, waiting in the wings to provide some leverage if needed, but uh, he got a hold of the right folks and, and they just did an amazing job getting this thing done. And I, I think it's, it's the least we can do to kind of tip our hat to those folks out there doing great work for us. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you so very much. I, I, we do not have Damien with us yet, but let's just uh, jump to the adjutant general here. And if you would like to tell us, um, first of all, why you want a provost marshal and what a provost marshal even is. For well, ma'am, the first thing, first thing I would tell you is this was something that I said I would do uh, when I campaigned for this job, and I don't want to get into the business of not doing something I said I was going to do. Um, in my view, th there's a need for this position here. Um, we would benefit by establishing the position uh, as described in H750. I researched uh, with some other states uh, who had a provost marshal position, and, and inclusive in that was National Guard Bureau. Um, a majority of those are used more in line with, with anti-terrorism uh, and force protection, you know, security inspections, and, and, and large part domestic operations. Um, what I'm proposing is also inclusive of level three law enforcement certification. Uh, what that does is it addresses, in my view, a, a shortcoming in our organization to have a, a consistent liaison capability with civil law enforcement. Uh, both positions that I proposed in the bill are, it's a traditional guard position, so it would be a drilling member of the guard, so they would work someplace else um, during the month and have drill weekends and annual training with us. Uh, but those positions, both the field grade officer and the senior NCO, can be Air or Army. So for us, um, that means it's a joint billet, so it has some uh, ancillary benefits of, of a career opportunity you know, for two or three years. Uh, for, for soldiers and airmen serving in the organization. Um, sounds pretty um, straightforward to me. Um, does anybody have any questions about what, first of all, let me ask you before people ask questions, was there any opposition from anywhere to this proposal? Uh, no, ma'am, not that I know of. I, I did know there are a number of um, co-sponsors on the bill, and it came out of the of House General um, pretty quickly uh, when I, I spoke with um, Tom Stevens about it. So I, I believe the support is there, uh, but I think it's something that we can certainly benefit from. So, okay. 
Allison. So, Greg, can you give us an illustration of how you think having had this position in place would have helped us uh, solve X problem in the last in the last year or so since you've been adjutant general? How would you have seen this person, this position, having been a, a benefit to you? Well, it, there's there's a degree of compliance that comes with this job. And if, if it's an organizational law enforcement function, and again, I'll come back to the liaison piece with civil law enforcement. So uh, one area, and I, I went through the language in, in the bill, um, so it serves as a primary liaison between the guard and federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies. And part of this, uh, I, I spoke with our judge advocate general, it's the reporting and documenting criminal, act, criminal activity that's identified, even though we have a duty to report, um, that it doesn't always happen. And with a duty to report, that means if a, a soldier or airman, any member of the organization um, has dealings with law enforcement, their duty is to report that. Well, sometimes we won't find out about it uh, until it comes time for mobilization and then it's too late and it comes up in a background check and we lose that person as a resource rather than being notified of it and taking appropriate action earlier on um, as in when it just happened. And that ties into the uh, NCIC uh, capability. Uh, right now we have NCIC capability, but I don't know that we have anybody qualified to use the system. So that's another one of the benefits of the position. Um, and providing assistance. So if, if, for instance, I've got somebody who is uh, accused of a crime or a suspect in a crime, we're dependent wholly on civil law enforcement to come deal with them if they're in, some, in fact in the guard. If we have this position, that person, the provost marshal or the assistant provost marshal, would have the capability to assist, you know, providing a supplemental affidavit, um, issuing somebody a citation to court, a notice of trespass, uh, or whatever it might be um, when it comes to dealing with, with the criminal process. And the other part of this that, and this is, you know, folks don't know a lot of times how we work. We do a lot of self-policing and we have regulations that govern that. So if somebody violates regulation here, we're doing a, a it's a dual process. So if it's an army regulation or an air force regulation, we would investigate that. But if it is a, parallel investigation, for instance, on, on the civil side, civil law enforcement, a violation of state law, this person would have the capability, or both positions would have the capability uh, to assist in investigating that as well. So when it comes to self-policing, if we're doing an investigation internal to the organization, we would appoint an officer, and that becomes basically an additional duty, and you're taking them away from their primary duty for a period of 30 days or longer, depending on the degree of complexity, to complete um, an administrative inquiry, like you know, a commander's inquiry or a command-directed inquiry. So if, if, if it's not a straightforward case and there's a degree of complexity, we'd be able to turn this over to the provost marshal team to do a more in-depth investigation. And if in th the process is determined that there is a criminal violation under state law, they would have the capability to be that liaison with civil law enforcement. And, and proceed with prosecution. Thank you. That that helps. Uh, but um, that seems like a, a, a position that is working uh, both does with it with individuals in the guard that are accused of crimes and liaison being a liaison with uh, mm -hmm. municipal and state uh, law enforcement. Also helping with self policing. Is there a degree of proactively uh, coordinating and being a liaison on um, on on more general actions that, that where the National Guard and state or municipal law enforcement would be in a proactive uh, working together to solve a problem like sandbagging in Montpelier or something. I mean, yes, ma'am. So that that's the tie-in with the their director of military support, and that's a very small I shop. Um, so we have one director of military support. So for instance, if we look at our current crisis that's ongoing, we have Colonel Gates who does that and he's embedded with the, the state EOC and works with Director Borneman. But anybody else that we sent down there is an augmentee and they're kind of thrown into the fray. Um, this provides us an additional resource who has that linkage 
and can help us in a number of areas um, as an additional liaison with civil authority, um, augments Colonel Gates and, and anybody else that we put in that team. Um, and then, let me see if we go back to the bill here one moment. It's in here. The other part of that would be the, um, the force protection and threat mitigation. And I think it's on page or page three of four. Line six C, cooperating with the direct and military support and other relevant federal agencies and anti-terrorism efforts and critical infrastructure protect, protection and related to domestic emergencies. And then D, providing information to the direct and military support in the relation to addressing criminal threats, handling of sensitive information and information sharing with civilian law enforcement agencies. So and there's also a direct, a direct linkage there. And um, we have armories across the state. And again, that direct of military support and our folks that do force protection, um, in my view, are understaffed and, and would benefit by having somebody who's able to come in on a drill weekend and do those inspections and make sure that we're doing everything we can to protect the force. So this, this is a full-time job? Uh, no, ma'am, not initially. It's a, a traditional drilling, two traditional drilling members of the Guard, either Air or Army. And um, I think this is a, a great kind of a test for us to see how it fits into the organization. Um, I'm sure there's a need for it. Uh, what I don't know at this juncture is how that need will grow. Um, so I talked with Mr. Gregg, our Deputy Adjutant General, and I think our best approach to that is we'll evaluate it uh, for a year, um, see where the need takes us. If there's enough demand, um, I think the best approach is to pursue this as a state employee position because of the law enforcement aspect of it. Thanks. Brian. Thank you, Madam Chair. General, you anticipated my question at the moment, then there would be no cost incurred to uh, create this position, but possibly down the road there might be. Yes, sir, and and that we would that would work out of the military department budget. Um, as to the training, uh, I used to be in law enforcement. I did that for eleven years here. Um, there is certainly a cost of if you sending somebody who is not currently certified um, through the Vermont Criminal Justice Training Council, there'll be a cost there. But I. I I'm, I am certain we have sufficient uh, full-time certified law enforcement officers in, in either the Air Army National Guard to get this thing off the ground and kind of give us a sense of where we're going to go with it. Thank you. Thank you. Anthony, do you have any questions? Well, actually, I had the same question Brian had about the costs, but uh, it just makes me realize sometimes how little I understand about the Guard. If it, it, I'm not sure why they have to ask us for permission to do this. Maybe it's a question for Damien. I'm not sure. I just, I mean, I, I have no problem with the, with what we're talking about. It seems like it makes sense to do, but if it's not going to cost anything, why? I'm just wondering why. What power do we have to allow them to do it or not do it? <laughs> so before uh, the Adjutant General answers and Damien answers, I um, remember the um, I. Th the history that Damien did for us when we were looking at the um, whether to elect or non, not elect the adjutant yeah. general. And he yeah. did, and it does seem to me that at one point there were some positions in there that no longer exist and they, it was all legislative because it is um, a state function. But yeah. I'm, I might be wrong, and the Adjutant General and Damien can um, actually uh, answer that, and then we'll have Damien walk us through the bill so that we understand the sections of the bill for whoever is going to report this. So my question, Damien and Greg, is why is this a legislative question? Why is the legislature dealing with this? Do, do you want to start from your perspective first, General, or, or would you like me to answer it? Why don't you take it first? I, I, I want to talk about the, the law enforcement aspect of it. I'm having a certified law enforcement officer. Sure. So um, the I think uh, the chair had it exactly right um, that we, the guard being a state and federal sort of dual entity, 
a lot of the um, guard structure is to some extent enabled under state law. Um, and so what this is doing is it's basically giving them the green light from the state to create this position. Um, and importantly, it's setting out guidelines for what the position does, uh, what its function is, what the requirements are for it. Um, and I think General Knight's going to talk about the certified law enforcement officer aspect of that, which is very important to this position. But that's something that we can do as a state legislature. Um, there are a number of other states who have uh, this position that I'm aware of, or at least have it mentioned in their statutes. Um, but I would say that this statute gives more detail and clarity about the position than any of the other state statutes that I'm aware of at this point. Um, it clarifies the type of law enforcement officer uh, and their role. The other ones, most often you'll see it mentioned in terms of uh, making arrests and transporting prisoners. Um, so, and, and I'm just speaking with respect to other states and I haven't read their regulations, which may provide more detail, but this, this is kind of doing two things. It's setting um, sort of clear um, standards for the position and it's also giving the legislative blessing to the creation of the position here. Um, I think it's possible for the guard to potentially do this on their own, but I think this gives them uh, a lot more support for that position. And also uh, as General Knight is going to speak to it, it provides clarity about the law enforcement aspect. So I'll defer to the general on the rest of it. Thanks. Thanks, Damien. So that's that's what's important in this is, is that law enforcement aspect. Um, and again, I would come back to um, having kind of a deterrent effect and have somebody within the organization who's answerable to the, the adjutant general um, work specifically for, for me um, to get at some of those um, historic aberrant actions that we've seen. Um, and, and I think there's just inherent benefit with that. Um, it sends a pretty clear message to the organization. The other part Any of this more? is the, the other part of this is this oh. and Damien's correct. It's, it's, it's a tandem approach. So in order for me to authorize the position, I have we have what we call a table of distribution and allowances. So currently this position is not turned on, so to speak. So I would have to work with National Guard Bureau and our force integration readiness officer to authorize the position with National Guard Bureau, both positions. And once that's done, um, I can implement it uh, with the blessing of, of the legislature. Thank you. Any other questions? So Damien, why don't you, um, we uh, jumped ahead here and heard from the general first. So why don't you walk us through the details of the bill so that we um, understand um, it and are prepared to answer any questions? Sure. So first, let me apologize for being late. No uh, apologies. Gail sent me the updated time, but I was juggling two kids when I saw the email and missed that the time had changed. So this is fine. Um, Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, Gail, is it possible to make me a co-host so I can share the bill? We have it on our oh, on our document page. Oh, perfect. So yeah, we've got it. OK, so I don't need to share my screen then. OK, no, so um, it's too hard to read anyway that way. Okay, I agree. I'm working on an iPad, so the, the print is always microscopic. Um, but the, so what this allows is it, it allows the adjutant general to appoint the provost marshal, um, who would be a rank of major or below. So, um, and then, uh, and requires them to be a certified level three law enforcement officer. Um, and it also allows the adjutant general to appoint an assistant provost marshal who would be a, a non-commissioned officer. So from the enlisted ranks uh, of the rank of first sergeant or below who also has to be a certified law enforcement officer. Um, so it, it's basically allowing the adjutant to appoint two positions, one from the officer uh, ranks 
one from the commissioned officer ranks and then one enlisted non-commissioned officer. Um, and then they would serve at the pleasure of the adjutant general, meaning that uh, you know, the adjutant general could hire or fire at, at will. There's, um, they answer directly to the adjutant. Their, their duties would be to serve as a primary liaison between the guard and federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies. Um, so not only the first thing is reporting and documenting criminal activity within the guard, and then providing assistance to the, the federal, state, and local law enforcement, and then overseeing the use of guard personnel and resources that during us providing assistance to civil authorities for disasters, special events, and similar activities, and also coordinating with state's attorneys and the attorney general in any uh, criminal cases related to the National Guard. So uh, like the general was talking about, um, they serve as a law enforcement liaison, both in the um, deterrence and prevention of crime and also in the prosecution of crime. Um, they would supervise the guards utilization of the national and state crime information centers um, and also oversee security related issues, um, including monitoring uh, local and state threats and anti-terrorism efforts, coordinating with relevant agencies in relation to providing security for high risk personnel, cooperating with the director of military support um, in anti-terrorism efforts and critical infrastructure protection related to domestic emergencies, and then also providing information to that director of military support in relation to addressing criminal threats, handling sensitive information and information sharing with civilian law enforcement agencies. So, and it's worth noting that director of military support is a federal uh, position. So this is basically providing a liaison through the guard between um, the guard and then state and federal or, or providing a liaison for the guard with both state and federal uh, law enforcement and uh, military authorities. Um, the powers here would be identical to the powers and immunities conferred on the state police um, and could be exercised statewide. So they're not limited um, to exercising their powers on, for example, military installations. Um, so they, they would be able to make arrests uh, and carry out other law enforcement duties statewide. Um, Which um, just it was the same for all level three certified officers, right? That's right. We're, we're yeah. keeping them on the same basis as the other level three uh, law enforcement officers here. Yep. Um, and then section two is just adding them to the definition of law enforcement officer um, for purposes mm -hmm. of Title 20. And then section three is the effective date, which would be July 1. So re really the major change is section one. The rest of it is, is one is a housekeeping change and the other is the effective date. So I just do have one question. The way I believe the way we um, identify law enforcement agency or entity is if they employ a law enforcement officer. So by adding this, does that now designate the National Guard as a law enforcement agency? That is a great question. And I think, let me just pull up that definition. I think you're right that it would designate the National Guard as a law enforcement agency. And I, uh, unfortunately, I see Betsy might be on the call, so she might be able to she is. help us out if she's listening in. Betsy um, Ann, are you listening? She's oh. there, but I don't know that she's really there. Oh, there she is. Oh. Hi, I'm back, <laughs> sorry. Did you hear the question? Yeah, I'm just looking at the bill itself. Oh, yes. Yeah, so I agree with Damien. So this would actually amend the Criminal Justice Training Council definition of a law enforcement officer. And then you can't see it in these definitions, 
But if you actually go into the Criminal Justice Training Council statutes to that definition section, you'll see that a law enforcement agency is defined as the employer of a law enforcement officer, just as you were saying, Madam Chair. So does this do anything? Does this, um, oh, now we're um, joined by the commissioner also. So maybe he wants to weigh in on this also. I don't know if you heard what we're talking about here, but we're looking at the bill that would allow the National Guard to create a provost marshal and deputy provost marshal, and they are to be level three law enforcement agencies. So my question was by adding that person to the list of law enforcement officer, does it now mean that the National Guard is considered a law enforcement agency because the definition of law enforcement agency is anybody who um, employs a law enforcement officer? And that it seems that that would, but does that have any impact on anything that is unintended? So I will uh, go to the four of you to help answer that question. And I'm sorry, Commissioner, you weren't part of this conversation, but that came up and there you are. Uh, this is the first I've heard of it, Senator, so I'm going to defer to your legal counsel and uh, we, can, we can effort that if you'd like, but it, it'll take a little while. I, I just wanna make sure that it doesn't have any unintended consequences in terms of what law enforcement agency means. Well, one of the things that would definitely require is for the new officer position to um, have maintain his or her annual certification. So having to go through basic, or excuse me, annual in-service training in order to maintain certification. It would also subject this officer to potentially the unprofessional conduct provisions of this chapter. And um, under those unprofessional conduct, uh, under that unprofessional conduct subchapter, a law enforcement agency would have the duty to investigate any allegations of unprofessional conduct committed by this new officer position. There's at least one, um, a couple of the uh, um, obligations that this would create. So General, does that, uh, Brian, did you have a question? Well, I, I can certainly wait because the folks here know a lot more about this than I do, but I didn't know whether there would be any impact with union representation for this person. I mean, a lot of the law enforcement people are members of unions. Does it automatically mean anything? Well, but a lot of them aren't. Okay. It, it wouldn't automatically, that's one I think I do know the answer to. It wouldn't automatically create a connection to one of the okay. collective bargaining All right. So. Um, General, are you, is the, it means that you have to um, abide by, the National Guard would have to abide by all the regulations uh, put on by the Training Council on law enforcement agencies. Is that a, a problem? Uh, no, ma'am. I, I don't see that as a problem. And, and as noted, um, I'm pretty sure at least for the initial um, hire for this position, should the bill pass, um, I've got sufficient resources, uh, folks within the organization, both Air and Army, that are already full-time certified officers uh, working at, at uh, agencies throughout the state. Okay, I, I just wanted to make sure that by designating the National Guard as a law enforcement agency, it doesn't have any unintended consequences. And it seems that Betsy Ann thinks that it doesn't because they'd have to they would just have to um, abide by the training council requirements of a law enforcement agency. Is that? That's understood, ma'am. Okay. All right. You be careful what you ask for. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I, I found that in this job, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any more questions from any committee members or anybody? Allison? Um, Greg, I just love to, I mean, I, I, uh, I, I understand the, the need for this from your point of view. I'm just curious, 
what the scale of the need is. How many, uh, how many incidents a year on average have you had uh, that uh, a, what's, what's the need for this? I mean, how many cases do you have a year that, that uh, where the National Guard is uh, having to deal with a, a guardsman or guardswoman um, having to deal with uh, state or local law enforcement? Well, man, we're, we're like any other organization of our size, and, and we've got folks that uh, sometimes don't do the right thing. I don't have a number off the top of my head, but yeah. it happens often enough uh, to so be of note. Um, and I would also say that this, it's, I wouldn't keep it simply focused on that aspect of it. There are other right. things that this position would do uh, yeah, for no, the Guard I, and for the state. I, I, I hear you. I, I hear that. But I was just curious if there was, you know, if you were concerned with the growing number or if there if it was fairly steady state and I don't know. Uh, yeah. trying to understand the need you know the, the volume of it i understand ma'am but I, I can tell you um any given month any given quarter um there, there's a handful of folks that, that do some uh some pretty silly things and and and, and one of the other things that I, I forgot to mention if if in fact when we're doing an investigation internally, um, either under Army or Air Force regulations, if at some point that investigation uncovers criminal activity on the part of the Guard member, our only answer is to defer it to civil law enforcement, which is fine, but having this position would allow that Provost Marshal to provide a supplementary affidavit. Yeah, no, I, I can see how this would be very helpful. Are and honestly, I, I hope that, that we find that the need is, is not there and we can keep this as a, a, a part-time position. Um, I really would, I'd hate to get in a position where the need is so great um, that it has to become full-time um, when it comes to criminal activity. But I think the liaison um, aspect of it also is important. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So. In a proactive, as we talked about earlier, in a, in a proactive way with things where the guard it would be helpful, a helpful addition. So any other questions, committee members? Are, are we um, ready to take this on? We have permission to vote on this, right, Anthony? I, yes, sorry, okay. my mute button was not cooperating. Are you ready okay. for a motion, Madam Chair? It looks like Brian is ready to I'll certainly one. yield to the Senator from Windsor. Oh, I was just going to make the motion that we uh, move the bill as Pat, move uh, H uh, 750 uh, as passed by the House. Uh, I would move that we vote it out favorably. Any other comments? Questions, concerns? Okay. All set? Yep. Okay, put your voting hats on. Senator Bray. Yes. Senator Clarkson. Oh, I have a hat here somewhere. Uh, yes. Senator Collimore. Yes. Senator Polina. Yes. Senator White. Yes. Great. Motion passes unanimously. So, reporter, Brian, did I see your hand? No. No? Okay. <laughs> I just did the one before this. Oh, okay. I have two coming up. Oh, Christopher, Anthony, you do you want to report this? I will, sure. Okay. All right, great. I would love it if... Um, Damien just gave me a little bit of back, not sort of a, some prose. In other words, not necessarily detail, but just a little bit of the rationale of the, generally what we're talking about. Sure. And I I'll, bet maybe the general would too. A couple of bullet points. And I think the general can maybe give you a quick, yeah. um, maybe able to provide you with a quick explanation of, of uh, why the guard is asking for this. Right. And I'll, I'll give you bullet points to summarize the bill. Thank you. All right. Can Thank do. You. Thank you, General. 
Thank, Thank you, you ma'am. Joining so, us. Have a great weekend. Thanks for all you do for us. You are Thank welcome. You. Thank you for all you do for us. Thanks, Damien. Thank you. Have a great weekend, everyone. Thanks. Bye. See you, Damien. Thanks. All right. I believe we are now shifting. Um, and uh, Commissioner, you seem to join us right at the exact time, so we could also pick your brain on that last one. So we are, um, I, I know you're here for a couple of things. One of the things that we talked about was um, each committee is being asked to um, suggest to the uh, appropriations committees need for um, funding that is coming out of either COVID or also for what is being called the skinny budget. And um, I know that uh, the agencies are probably giving their requests to the governor. So that's pretty well covered. We've been dealing with like the sheriff's offices and municipalities and EMS and stuff that aren't necessarily in an agency. But if you had information requests that are not be you think are not being met elsewhere in other um, pieces of legislation or budget suggestions and also um, I think you had some comments on s124 yes thank you senator I, I do have a number of observations on 124 uh, but to address the first part uh, to begin with um, Department of Public Safety doesn't have any specific uh, requests. Uh, we are administering uh, an approved grant for law enforcement costs related to COVID-19. The bulk of those actually are going outside the Department of Public Safety to entities like the Criminal Justice Training Council that have incurred some um, unusual operating expenses to maintain operations. Uh, Beyond that, I would just encourage, uh, if, if there are funding requests coming to you from other first response agencies and they are related to the COVID crisis, we should make an effort at deconflicting them with potential FEMA reimbursable costs um, okay, yeah. before they go for state funding. Um, so we can make uh, some recovery staff available to vet those um, if we can get eyes on the universe of, of, uh, of need. Um, if there isn't, if there is anything else on that topic, I'll pivot to, uh, to 124. We, we, um, did, uh, the department of health, the only, uh, request that we've actually sent forth with, um, money attached to it and, um, very specific was the EMS and Dan Basti and Shayla Livingston have been part of that conversation all along. So they probably have it and um, then I will forward to you the, um, when we get the, it put together from the law enforcement, I mean, from the sheriff's offices, I will make sure that you get that. I'm not sure they're eligible for FEMA because they're not a municipality, but I'll forward that to you also. And um, the other one that we heard from was the academy and some things that they may be needing because of the way they've had to shift the um, doing their their training. Okay. And so I know I know that we've uh, we're planning to fund the academy with the I think it's the majority of the uh, the inbound um, law enforcement grant uh, on COVID that's coming from the federal government. Okay. So. And, and while we're talking about the Academy, I will um, reiterate um, our support for um, the, and a uh, quickly, um, a quick resolution to the fact that they have no executive director and naming an interim director quickly and um, allowing the Academy, the training council or whatever portion of it is going forward with the, the search because they need to have that well underway as they, when they, um, when we hopefully come out of this, they're, they're really suffering right now by trying to uh, make decisions by triumvirate. Triumvirate. Uh, 
I am aware, Senator. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, the timing of the process, uh, it, I went back through my email. It was March 31st that um, the hiring committee, which I'm part of, I wasn't active on at the time, was uh, had launched an email indicating uh, an effort to try to do interviews in the two weeks that followed that. Uh, we were immersed in COVID um, lockdown at that point with fast and furious uh, emergency response, which has uh, abated a bit, but I will observe that the pace continues uh, both in the emergency response in restart and recovery all occurring at the same time. So uh, it is on the, the radar to uh, have the administration provide support to the council for that hiring effort. I actually have a communication framed. Uh, it was approved just in the last 24 hours by uh, the governor's office and the secretary of administration. Um, but I, I will uh, push back a little on anything you might have heard and just say it was not possible to run a hiring process under the circumstances effectively. We would have made significant mistakes um, and potentially ended up with problems. So uh, that said, um, we're hoping to get that moving uh, absent any other curveballs that this virus throws us in the next uh, few days. Thank you. Brian, did you want to weigh in on that? No, I uh, had occasion yesterday, Commissioner, to speak directly with the governor about that. And uh, he indicated that he was well aware of the situation as you've just described and uh, that the uh, interim director, at least one of the names that came up was just recently appointed as one of the side judges in Rutland County. So uh, that might present some challenges for him to try to do both jobs. Um, so as I understand it, there are three people right now, maybe he's one of them that are sort of mm -hmm. trying to, uh, give direction to the, uh, to the Academy and the training council. Is that right? Yeah, that was the, uh, that, those were the emergency measures put in place to, uh, enable the Academy to pivot to, uh, an altered operating posture as, uh, you know, face-to-face, -face, uh, instruction became impossible. I was not aware of that, uh, that, that fragment about um, an individual having a new assignment. Um, Steve but we Bernard. Are, yeah, yeah I, I, I figured that. Um, we are going to, uh, uh, for the, uh, I guess the, the council will get a preview of the, the email that's coming hopefully later today um, that we're hoping to go directly to a hiring, uh, full hiring process rather than an interim process just because doing the effort twice um, presents challenges as well, so. That's encouraging news. Thank you very much for working on it. Thank you. Okay, you want to shift to 124? Certainly. Um, it's a nice short bill. Um, so <laughs> uh, I've been, uh, I've had uh, some of our folks walk me through the, the parts that are important. Unfortunately, uh, finding the requisite time to digest it all is still elusive. We're still uh, pretty well booked solid from uh, 6.30 in the morning until uh, well past that in the evening. Um, so it probably hasn't gotten as much attention as it would otherwise. Um, I'll start by saying uh, you know, there's a lot of innovative things in there. And as you've heard from me in the beginning of the session, um, we really do think we're at an inflection point with policing uh, in Vermont to accelerate the innovation that's been taking place over the last few years. Um, we've presented a modernization framework. Uh, I might refer to that a little bit um, in the testimony of the next few minutes. Um, so innovation is very much the way uh, we, we think we should be going. Uh, there are, I'm only gonna address uh, a, a few of the things I think there's two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine of the 30 or so sections. Um, so if there's questions on the others, I, I will have to get back to you because I'm not fully up to speed on all of them. Um, and uh, one of the themes that will emerge over the next few minutes is I think some of these things may make sense, but we may not be positioned well right now to take them on uh, because of the circumstances and the pace of the operating environment that we anticipate uh, continuing for the foreseeable future without really any way to know when uh, our collective staff is going to come out from under uh, the crisis that we're still facing. So I'll take them one by one. Um, 
in, and I'll, I'll go by section number. So if you've been taking testimony in some other way, I apologize, uh, but I have- No, that's fine. As section okay. numbers. Um, section two under council membership. Um, my observation is that, uh, again, uh, talking about that inflection point and the need to accelerate innovation and training, there's potentially an opportunity to, to modernize the council membership but I, I'm not sure we're at a point where we know exactly what those needs will be. So rather than doing this once and then potentially coming back to you and revisiting it again, I would suggest we put this piece on hold. Let's get a new executive director on board and um, put a pin in this until we've got a robust uh, plan that the council can develop with the new executive director and other stakeholders about where we think we should go. And then that will inform uh, the makeup of the council to allow us to modernize uh, that structure once rather than doing it once now and then coming back with a whole bunch of new information in a matter of months or however long it takes to get that together. Um, but not uh, not a bad idea, uh, just the, the timing. We, we might want to do things in a different order. Um, certification options, sections four, five, six, and seven. Um, I would put sort of in that same category. I will uh, readily admit there may be some things that are needed right now that I'm not aware of and I haven't had a chance to, to talk with anyone who's proposed specific certification um, uh, and training standards changes that might be time sensitive. So if you set that aside for a second, there may be something that does need to be addressed immediately. Uh, but I would roll that into sort of the training modernization framework and um, the work that we're that I'm I guess I'm hoping that the council undertakes with a new director uh, over the next, you know, six to 12 months once we get the new director on board um, and then coming back with a, uh, a more robust framework for what some of those modernization initiatives might look like. Uh, I can take questions one at a time, or I can go through the rest, whichever is your preference. I'm going to ask Betsy a question first. I went to yesterday's, and I can't get the document itself. It just tells me there's no document such as S-124. Darn, I was just um, able to go by Bill on the committee webpage and, just, and do S-124, search by Bill. Yeah, I did that and told me that there wasn't any such thing. Huh. So it's coming up perfectly it, for me. Is if that's the case, Senator, we can all free up some time. I'll, uh, I'll have Oh, it. Commissioner. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. I just, um, I just was able to access it myself because I just pulled up the draft we reviewed yesterday, the draft 5.1 annotated okay. the summary. Okay. It, did you do it by, oh, it says text search. Are you on the committee webpage and then? Yeah. Did you I just want to make sure that I'm following the right sections. Yeah. Are you able to, were you able, so you, when you searched by bill, it didn't come up, huh? Right. Are other members experiencing that issue? Because I'm able to access it for, Without it, how, how do you I have get it? it open. You have it? I have it open, yep. How did you get it? I went to committees, GovOps, and then um, documents. Yes. Documents and handouts. Okay. Yep. And, and then... it's on yesterday's. There's two. Uh, oh, there documents. it is. Okay. I. Okay, I went to the wrong place for the yesterday's meeting. Okay, thank you. I, I added Sorry. two. Okay, thank you. All right. Sorry, Commissioner. No problem. I just wanted to know what was in sections four, five, six, and seven. Okay. Again, if there's a uh, if there's a time sensitive need for something, uh, you know, I'm, I'm I'd be interested to take to to understand what that is and and maybe uh, provide some additional background on that. But the, uh, I'm just happy I haven't had a chance to reach out to folks to to figure that out. 
I think uh, that um, on four and four anyway, and then um, five is five and six were brought to us by um, the council that they felt that those were pretty important to keep in there right now. Four, um, as Senator Collimore likes to say, it has no deadline. It's just a gentle nudge to make sure that you keep doing it. It has no deadline. I, uh, Betsy? Just to confirm that section four does require the council to adopt rules in regard to alternate oh. routes to certification. And we did hear from the chief yesterday um, and we talked about that rule making deadline because right now uh, section six does require the council to adopt those rules by July 1, 2021. But right. after discussing with the chief yesterday, the committee tentatively agreed to extend that uh, uh, rule adoption deadline to be July 1, 2023. Okay. So that is... I, again, I, I, I think uh, this level of, of innovation is uh, is where we're going. Yeah. So, you know, which the order of operation is, uh, you know, at your discretion, whether it's uh, you want to get a new director on board and have them craft some things or you want to direct some things ahead of time. I'm not sure that makes a, a, a big difference. Well, I think that the, the direction here is just telling you to keep on keep on trying to innovate. And that's um, Senator Colomar's gentle nudge. I used a different phrase, but um, we won't go there. Understood. So I won't, I won't spend a whole lot more time uh, talking about that. Uh, I'll move on to section 10. Um, but five and six did come from the uh no five. Oh no i'm thinking of the um never mind sorry okay section 10 um would make some changes to what gets reported to the council in terms of misconduct reports and would mm -hmm. uh problematically expand to allegations that isn't going to work uh for a bunch of reasons um, in the uh -oh. current operating environment, allegations could be something that's posted on social media. We, we chase a lot of red herrings in that regard and reporting them all to the council would create an inordinate amount of work and would, uh, I think would run afoul of, uh, potentially a foul of collective bargaining agreements and a bunch of other things that it, it's just, there, there isn't a constructive reason to report allegations. I think the balance that the existing statute um, has, which is credible allegations, uh, makes sense. It allows for an initial vetting and we're not chasing um, ghosts uh, for lack of a better description. That's interesting because we heard kind of the opposite yesterday from um, the chief and from um, a member of the council that these are, there's no additional work for the training council here because they're not investigated. They're just, they're just um, reported and. It's setting up a situation where you're reporting rumors and innuendos and, and potentially false accusations and trolls on the internet and there's no guardrails. It, it's, it, I'll, I'll, I will be clear, it's a, it would be a bad piece of policy to further those kinds of reports. Well, I think given that, that what we should do is we should ask, um, because we heard different testimony from the council itself, is um, ask you to figure that one out um, <clears throat> because clearly there's a difference of opinion there. Was Am I right about that committee? Because I, I, I was sure that because we talked a lot about that and um, so. I will uh, reach out, but I doubt there's going to be anything that's going to change uh, the position of the Department of Public Safety. Um, between my experience in public safety and, and my prior job with the largest municipal agency, probably have the most uh, exposure to these kinds of uh, events. Um, and I, there is no constructive, I cannot see anything constructive coming of passing along this kind of information. It would be 
uh, it would be a significant problem. Okay. Uh, just, um, yeah, um, uh, Commissioner, just so um, you can have, do you have uh, access to the section by section summary? I, if, if I shut you off and go to that potentially. No, uh, okay. I just want to make sure that you have access to it. Um, this was a proposal that was um, recommended by the council and I'll just point uh, just whenever you do have the chance to look at it. This language is at the top of page three and it, part of the rationale um, for the council making this recommendation was so that the council would be made more aware of the allegations of category B conduct because agencies would still maintain the authority to investigate these allegations, but it's a way for the council to just be made more aware of these allegations and track to ensure that all the different agencies are actually conducting a valid investigation. So just to give some background on where that language came uh from. Understood. Uh, that's not a mechanism that actually achieves that. That's just a, this. This creates a mechanism to report rumors, and there's no constructive. I, I cannot see a constructive use for that kind of information. Um, constructing a uh, a system by which um, credible accounts um, or credible reports of misconduct are tracked makes perfect sense. But um, at the stage where it's just allegations. There's a universe of those that is, um, there are a lot of different ways to describe it, but there's, that there are lots of, uh, of attempts to discredit um, law enforcement folks in the wake of little things like traffic stops where people will call, um, they'll post something to social media. We reach back out to them to, to follow up on their complaint. They never respond to us. But th the way this is worded, we would have to report all of those things. And I'm not actually concerned with the, the, the way the state police operate, but I say we for law enforcement in general reporting each and every one of those fragments back to the council would just create a haze of information that would be hard to cut through to see what was real. So it would not be constructive. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Section 12, there's language around having DCIC create a uniform list of, uh, of events, and this is already in progress, so yep. I just flagged that for you. I, I don't know that it requires um, legislation, and, and the, the legislation might inadvertently box in some creativity um, around uh, how that's being done and how it evolves, so I... I'd, my suggestion would be ask us to report back to you, not necessarily a legislate to report back, but ask us in in January and we'll tell you how it's going and what, the, what it looks like. And if it's not right, then, then uh, take a look at potentially legislating it at that stage. And that will weave into the, my next uh, piece as well, which is section 13. Well, again, I think that section 12 just says, come up with some definitions. It doesn't tell you how to do it or anything. And it's, we know that many, many of these things like the, um, the looking at different methods of doing it there, there's nothing here that says how you have to do them, but we, we want to make sure that we keep, um, keep these issues alive and that they stay there. And we, uh, or I anyway, um, trust that the training council and you will all work together to keep them going but we don't know who will be um, a commissioner next year and we don't know who the training council members will be next year. So I, I think that this is our attempt to say, these are things that are important to us and um, we, we just want you to keep them alive. That's- Understood. Uh, in 13, um, there's a, a, a framework created to have VCIC create quarterly reports for towns that don't have police departments. Um, as you may recall, one of our modernization strategies and one that is still alive and being reinvigorated right now, I had a meeting on it over the last couple of days, is uh, a statewide computer-aided dispatch and records management system that is moving, um, that will obviate the need for this and create forward-facing uh, records that 
uh, any town can see, uh, not just for crime. And I, I, I would I would note that BCIC, <clears throat> excuse me, tracks crime, and that is just a fraction of what is actually happening in communities in terms of things that uh, elected officials and community members may want to know. So we keep turning back to VCIC as the, um, the, the mechanism to inform what's happening in communities when that it's really only showing you somewhere between 10 and 20% of what's happening in communities. So uh, I would offer that a, uh, the, the new technology system and the mapping and dashboards that will go with it are the solution to that problem um, because they'll provide much more robust information. And one of the side effects mm -hmm. of um, the COVID experience over the last few months has been a, uh, a, a swift learning curve on the part of um, executive agencies and uh, the Agency of Digital Services to really accelerate uh, the construction of visualized dashboards and, and data, um, as you hear on every Friday from Commissioner Pichek. Um, but there's many other layers to that data as well that there just isn't time to report on on the Fridays. But suffice it to say, we've got a lot more tools and experience in the toolbox um, from a, a three month exercise that has uh, given us probably 10 years of experience in that 90 day framework. So yeah. there's there's more to come on that. So I, I, I would ask yeah. that you set that piece aside um, so that VCIC doesn't have to create something that'll be obsolete pretty quickly. Okay, Brian. And that's exactly the commissioner. I think hit what I was going to say. Um, you're suggesting that the municipality that doesn't happen to have a local police force would bear the responsibility somehow to be able to look at this dashboard and collect their own data and not create another job for the VCIC to do. We would, uh, to, to clarify, Senator, we would create the, the dashboard and the ability to very easily say, "I want to see for the." Uh, village of uh, Swanton. Woodstock. Woodstock. Woodstock <laughs> Village. It's, Brian, I, it's Brian's favorite to town to drive through. Although I dare say Bridgewater is a little more challenging at the moment. I'm sorry. I want to see all burglaries between November 1st and March 1st, between the hours of 6 a.m. and 10 p.m., and it'll render that data for you. And I want to see that set against how many there were last year for the same time period that kind of sort of simple, intuitive, but, uh, but informative dashboard is where we're headed. So the town itself could do that if the, if the dashboard was up. It wouldn't necessarily be another chore for someone else to provide to the town. Correct, and it would be nimble enough that you could, you could check the boxes of the things you wanna see. You might wanna yep. see noise complaints that are not crime, that are not something okay. BCI is going to be able to tell you about because it doesn't exist in their world but you might want to see the number of noise complaints that were responded to in that, um, in that village or town. Allison. So uh, Michael, that's great. One of the things we're trying to accomplish here was actually uh, educating the towns because we heard from several towns that had no idea anything happened in their town. They thought their town was perfect and there were no problems at all. And all of our town towns are perfect, despite the fact that there may be an occasional crime. Uh, yeah, right. Uh, but I get, my point is here is that it, this is great to create a data-driven dashboard. Your idea of heaven, I know. I know you, Shirley. I know you. You love this kind of thing. But I would also say that they're only as good as the people who actually use them. So what I would ask as we develop this exciting data-driven dashboard is educate a liaison with the Vermont League of Cities and Towns to really promote and educate their select boards about its use so that they can actually use it and will go to it and learn to use it as a tool for their own self-education about the activities in their towns. That sounds great. Uh, to be clear, that's probably well into 2021 before we can construct such a thing because we've got to build the front end of the system first. Yeah. But I love, Michael, your, your saying, we've had 10 years of education in a 90-day framework or whatever you said. It's, it, you know, you, you have, you've had education through the fire hose. It's we true. It's, 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 it, we've been living dog years. It's, uh, 
it's odd. Uh, <laughs> That's a great idea. Seven years. Ah. Um, there's some makeup changes in 14 through 17 to the LEAB. Uh, I don't necessarily have a position. I was just wondering if there's a um, if there's a um, if there's an issue or if there's something something that uh, folks are trying to achieve that might inform a position. We were asked by the um, both uh, law enforcement division of Our Department of Fish and Wildlife action. and of um, motor vehicles to add them to the LEAB. Oh, right. LEAB. Understood. Okay. So it's that simple. All right. Yeah. Uh, that makes perfect sense. They are, uh, they are key uh, partners in, uh, in all the work that happens in Vermont. So that makes sense. Um, we, we, yes, Allison? We may have other requests to, to join this. Well, we haven't yet. So this okay. is where we are. Okay. Okay. Uh, section 18 uh, has some uh, dispatch language in it. Uh, as you know, in our modernization strategy, we went out on the, the limb to address dispatch, which has been the, the, the can the, <laughs> that's been kicked down the road, the hanging chad, the whichever analogy you would prefer. Um, and um, so we do have a plan for that. Uh, I, in this, it's got some regulation of technical and operating standards. And in section 19, uh, adopting standard rules for communication centers. I don't know that either one of those has been identified as a specific weakness. Can, can I just, um, we decided yesterday after our hearing from the council and from various people, we're removing that section. Then I will abbreviate my testimony. And be, <laughs> okay. Well, uh, and we will deal with it in January, Betsy Ann. But I believe the committee wanted to maintain the rulemaking on DPS rates for dispatch, for the dispatch it performs. Yeah, it's just the, um, the, the one about the technical and operational um, processes. Okay. And we believe that uh, you're already uh, doing the, um, the rates. You've, you've been working on that for some time and we just um, think that it would be a good idea to do it by rule so that there is time for public input and stuff, but that's all. That's fine. Um, that will probably uh, well, obviously, we'll follow whatever time frame that you set. Uh, but in terms of implementation of the billing, uh, given the fiscal challenges that municipalities will have in the wake of the COVID epidemic, we're probably looking at pushing that back beyond where we had originally um, envisioned, uh, which I don't even remember the timeline. But it was, I think it was starting at 25% in July of next year. And then going in at twenty and twenty five percent increments thereafter, so it'll uh, it'll likely be delayed a bit. And I don't think we have any time connected to that. Is there, Betsy, a time to have the rules done? You're muted. Yeah, I'm just getting to the correct section of the bill. I believe there's still. Yeah, so the, the um, at least you're removing the rules regarding standards, but mm -hmm. there would still be the rule adoption deadline of July 1, 2021 in regard to the rates. Is that uh, too early, Commissioner? Is that what you're saying? No, no. I, I think adopting the rule by July of 21 is fine. Uh, okay. it, it's, it's the implementation of the, the schedule, I think, that we originally thought would begin in July of 21 that depending on how the finances shake out for municipalities, we may have to delay a bit. And Brian, does that address your, your concerns? Uh, that you yeah, have? I believe so. And, and the person that, that I talked to was from a fire department and they wanted to at least have two or three more years before the actual rate goes into effect. So commissioner's right. And that was before the virus even hit. So uh, this is a process for sure. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, the last section I have a comment on is uh, 28, which is uh, town public safety plans. Um, and actually, and I think there's a section after that about ACCD grants, um, mm -hmm. which is unusual since I, that used to be my job. But uh, the, I, I am channeling uh, information from our uh, emergency management director who would be here today, but is moving after working 20 hour days for the last three months. Um, oh. Th oh. These. This uh, neither one of these has been vetted through emergency management and may pre present a variety of challenges with statewide emergency planning and our existing statewide emergency operations plans. So uh, essentially, uh, our feedback is neither one is ready for prime time at this point. So the I'm what page are we? It's on page seven and eight of the uh, section by section. And Commissioner, the date on that is 2023. Right. Understood. But the the just the language and the 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 what's framed itself really needs to be vetted by uh, our emergency management professionals and uh, cross checked against all the FEMA overlays and what the standard practice is for state emergency management. How does it weave into the state's emergency management plan? How's it going to weave into the state's emergency management plan that will likely receive uh, notable updates in the wake of COVID-19? Um, it, it just hasn't been vetted by the folks that do this work on a statewide basis, and we really need them to be able to focus on this before we venture even into something that isn't going to be galvanized until 2023. What, what section is that? I'm showing you my... Yeah, I'm showing in my notes is 28 and then grants in I think it's 29 or yeah. some section thereafter. Okay, that's where I am. Okay, um, so committee, we, uh, I guess we should run this by them, but we, we felt that um, it's really, really important for towns to look at this issue. Um, those towns who uh, we started actually by at one point having a bill that said they had to have their, they had to provide all their own law enforcement. Um, and then we went to having them include emergency planning in their town plan, which didn't seem to work. And now we're asking them to do some kind of an emergency plan um, but so these are if I could just editorialize for a second, mm -hmm. these are not uncomplicated documents that need to be created and 251 times over is going to create a lot of technical assistance requests for the Division of Emergency Management, which is pretty well underwater yeah. in your term. And I think they would be they would I would very much prefer that they be involved in trying to help you, uh, one, uh, get a full understanding, and, and maybe it exists already, but I just don't know that, of, of what the, each town's uh, emergency manager does now, what reports and what plans are required already, and try to weave together the current state of process with whatever uh, potential ideal state of process exists in the future. So it's a, it's a mindfully constructed roadmap to what you want to see. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's just going to take a little bit of time. Um, so don't mm -hmm. disagree with the goal, uh, but we really, we, we need Erica and her, her team involved uh, to help frame it, I think. Okay. Um, so that's section 28. Um, any questions on that committee? That, make, that makes some sense to me. Yeah. Anthony, did yeah, you? I'm just, I'm just not sure from the commissioner's comments whether we're saying we're not going to do it or whether we're just putting it off. I, what, here's, I, what I would suggest is um, when the uh, emergency management division is not stuck in a tree by COVID-19, um, that we find a, a work session where they can walk you through um, what's the state plan? What does, uh, how does that interact with the federal government? How does it interact with this, the, the various um, first response agencies? How does it interact with each town and what they already submit to emergency management in terms of plans? And mm -hmm. um, 
and then it, then have you walk them through where are you trying to go? What's the what is the ideal state that you're looking for? Right. And have them help uh, bridge whatever gap there may be uh, to an end. So I, I think it requires some work. Are you also saying that we might have a better idea what the plans would include when we're on the other side of the pandemic? We're definitely going to have some some new ideas on what the plans need to uh, account for. Uh, I don't think ventilators will be on that list, but things like personal protective equipment regionally, locally, because we can't rely on the federal government uh, to do that. Um, field hospitals, uh, how to keep mm -hmm. medical practices and things running in, in, uh, in a future pandemic. Uh, you know, the unfortunate reality is this is the third novel virus in 18 years, so there will be another. I, I, it make, that makes some sense to me to just take this out and for whoever happens to be here in January, to really sit down with emergency management and have this discussion and do it then. I agree. Okay. Are you saying the same thing about the planning grants? Because those are just for regional um, planning, not for emergency management, not for emergency services. Yeah, uh, the director also had some concerns about that crashing into the existing work and creating a, a parallel track. Um, and given the, the budget challenges that we're facing now, um, I'll just add that it would seem to make sense to hold on on those and, and save that little fragment of money for uh, all the other needs that are coming. But, Allison? Um, Michael, I, I understand you, but I also understand that this is gonna be a long-term process, the, the encouraging and we really want to begin the encouragement of, of regional uh, public safety coordination and and management. And you know, if is there something that would be appropriate to add in the you know to have in this book? I, I mean, I I'm reluctant to give that up. I mean, I, I understand the other pieces because I think our um, anyway I understand the other pieces, but I'm reluctant to give up this because we. This is uh, this is important to us to move this conversation along the regional the regional conversation. Got it. So we were focused in the review on on sort of the the planning for public safety slash emergency management versus the longstanding conversation about the advantages to regionalization. And I, I won't hesitate to say that because as we've discussed previously, the I forgot the number of reports because we've been immersed in other things, but the dozens that exist all do say that regionalized safety services do make perfect sense. Um, I don't know that we've got the, uh, the exact, um, cor the correct policy uh, nuances to that yet as they've been elusive for 50 years or so. Uh, I, I will sort of say off, and this is more off the cuff, don't take it as a policy position, but as a, sort of a longstanding thought that if there were a way to um, begin to think about public safety in the same way we do, high, the, the federal government does highways, where if you adopt best practice, you get access to certain resources. Um, that that model versus the, the, the that carrot model versus a stick model may be the way to go. Um, the challenge we have is that the state doesn't invest a lot in uh, in statewide emergency services in general, so we don't have a lot of carrots to play with. Um, but it, as a construct, it's it's always struck me coming from the municipal side and now being on the state side that if we could think about that as the the way to go, um, that 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 may have some value. And, and that is the, the thought around this, uh, the computer-aided dispatch and records management system that we're talking about, then being able to also report out robust data to towns and policymakers to make good decisions. That construct is in play. If you recall in the modernization strategy, it says that our hope is that if we uh, can thread the needle, that that system will be available for free to all municipalities so they don't have to pay for it. And the quid pro quo, to use the, the 
uh, the, the <laughs> more commonly used 2020 vernacular, I guess that's 20, 2019 at this point, uh, is that uh, in exchange for that, the, that we all collectively get to use the, the data, anonymized data, not per people's personal identifying information, to make decisions, to make statewide policy decisions, to inform uh, you know, um, bias, um, bias free policing policy to inform use of force policy on a statewide basis rather than having things fragmented. So I just use that as an example of how we may um, look at incentivizing folks to share services uh, in the future. And I'll also note that we're, we're accelerating our plans um, for shared facilities in the wake of COVID-19 as well. They were on the drawing board but the need to uh, be more efficient and to save money is now right at the doorstep, um, maybe leaking across the threshold. And uh, so we're, we're accelerating those plans as well. Yeah, I, you know, I have, um, I really wanna see this go forward, but I also understand that even if we, even if we put it forward, it may not make it through appropriations when they start dealing with. So we're just, I guess, going to have to make that decision whether we're going to, um, right. because we don't have the final say on whether the money is allocated or not. Yeah, and I should be clear, I, I know I testified to this back in, I think, January. Um, the Department of Public Safety is not in a position to say to police departments and fire departments, hey, you should regionalize because it is an individual town by town decision, but they do have a variety of options and there may be better ways to deliver efficient services by collaborating, creating regional entities, or in some cases just contracting for service with existing entities, whether that's a sheriff's department or uh, a municipal department that does exist in their, their region, there are options. Um, I don't think it's a bridge too far to say it, it's very difficult in the 21st century for small municipalities to stand up law enforcement uh, organizations and be successful. They're very expensive. They're very complicated to run today, much more complicated than 20 years ago. So for those reasons, it, it does make sense to look at creative approaches. Yeah. Well, yes. Uh, Madam Chair, I, I apologize, but I uh, just on the timing front, I thought we were gonna be done at three today. And so I unfortunately have a 315 and I apologize, but I'm gonna have okay. to go. All right, well, what I would like to do is um, look at this again on Tuesday and um, we're gonna have to make some decisions because it hasn't passed the floor yet. So if we wanted to get to the house and I would ask the um, commissioner to work with the council around those um, suggestions that came from the council about the um the reporting of allegations so that yeah. we can have some um some uh cooperation there and so, some some kind of a a resolution because otherwise if there's a difference of opinion here it's going to rest to us to make that that decision and um I don't know that we're in the best position to do, we'll do it, but um, I would ask that uh, you work together to try to come up with some kind of a resolution. And I will call the chair as soon as I get a free moment this afternoon. Okay, any, yes, Betsy Ann. Just one thing, I don't know if the commissioner has time or has looked at it yet, but one of the provisions that we haven't discussed yet with the commissioner is sections eight and nine, which is the requirement for a potential hiring agency to contact the officer's current agency to obtain an analysis of the officer's performance at the agency. I don't know if the commissioner has time to address this now or looked at that, but just to put that on your radar, that's just something that we didn't discuss this afternoon. Well, that actually also came from the council so that when you talk to them about the, the reporting, if you could make sure that you're in agreement on that. I think we are, uh, uh, that I'll, I'll, a three word answer makes perfect sense. Okay, perfect. We like that. Um, okay, committee.
Tuesday we will do um, the, what did I say? We're gonna do elections and we'll do finish, hopefully finish this up. Betsy Ann, if you can, um, I think we've agreed to take out section 13. Um, we have, we should have the conversation about section one and then four, five, six, and seven and 10. We'll have that discussion. Does that make sense committee? Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, you commissioner for taking time yes. to meet have a with good us. Weekend. Thank you, you too. Take care. Good weekend, Betsy. Bye everybody. Bye. Bye. Happy Bye. weekend. See ya. Bye. Thank you.